first lightning talk speaker is Rosario Agusti de Perez, who's an architect and urban designer uh, in Venezuela who works in the barrios of Venezuela and who was recognized a few years ago as a G GIS hero. And she will be talking about a uh, geodesign framework for illegal developments in Latin American cities. So, Rosario. Hi. Thank you. <laughs> Hello. In Venezuela, that we have all these illegal developments, like in mainly all Latin American cities, we have been trying to work with applying urban design, um, geodesign to urban design for developing in, um, what we call upgrading plans for the barrios that are all around the main, the largest cities of Latin America. We centered in the most difficult ones that are this kind of developments. It's very, very difficult to try to improve. When you see that mess, you can hardly think about the solution. So we have to define which design, your design environment we're going to be working in. And it's what we call B2. Illegal occupations where settlers have occupied the land with their cultural patterns to shape the land. They don't care about geography unless it's a very, very difficult problem that they can't locate there. So, this is what we are dealing with. Instead of a natural geography, we have a built geography. This is the scene of Caracas where you can see how the, all the mountains are covered, completely covered, by this illegal development. So, what's the challenge that we are facing today? How can we change through geodesign? Up to 50% of the urban land is occupied in the largest cities with illegal developments but they want change. So we have to think about a way to do that. This is the largest barrio in the whole Latin America continent. It has 120,000, that's a population, in 96 hectares. So it's absolutely crowded. There is no open space, no services, nothing. It's just one house piled over the other one. And when Jack said about what was the, this is a social confrontation. Actually, you can see how the illegal development is coming, it's like two armies, one in front of the other. So we thought, could we use the regenerative uh, design tool and reverse the conditions of an illegal development? Our answer was no. Reversing is impossible. We would have to move millions. Caracas has like three million living in these conditions. So we have to find another way of changing. And we thought restoration. We have a term in Venezuela that's, uh, that's uh, in Spanish, habilitación. I tried to translate it and the only word I could find was enable. The, we have to enable the settlement to work better, to improve their quality of life. So restoring is the only thing we can find. And basically, public space. When we see this, I remember being an architect that when we try to do something like this, they say, makeup, that's no good but makeup is what they want first. This is Caracas, and this is Argentina. It's a pride having a better looking community. And there is a statement from uh, our Mexican distributors. He says, poor doesn't mean being ugly. And they feel that way. People from these barrios want to look better. And painting is the most easy, the easiest thing to do. So we have to respect 
their aesthetical values. This one I like to show because some people working in the municipalities in Caracas are trying to, to fulfill the demand for having a better look. So artists are working on this. They asked to, they wanted to have a, an open space for playing baseball. It's a very small space, but the project was providing the space and giving a better appearance to the facades. I think this one was great. And really, residents were enthusiastic about the proposal. Restoring approach has made me try to find out examples from around the world that could give us an idea of how we can change. This, what you see, underneath is Competa, Andalusia, in Spain, where this houses, everybody comes and takes a look. They are Las Casas Colgantes, and they, they are located very nearby, um, well, that place. And the other one is Peru, Lima, Peru. This is this, are, um, this is a settlement of very, very poor people who pick up um, material for recycling. And they are located um, at the, that's the river, Rimac, um, at the, beside the river. And it's so, so ugly, the appearances. So this is an idea we gave them. Of course, this is rock and that is sand. But anyway, there could be a way of trying to solve the problem and become a tourist attraction instead of, of a very, very ugly example of poverty. <clears throat> Can we reverse the damage through restorative design? Well, this is what the government is doing in Caracas. All these houses that were nearly falling apart, were saved and redecorated. And you know, all the residents were so happy that they were kept there in their living place. And many architects from the schools of architecture are supporting the idea of even though you look at that and say, oh, how cobble that concrete, but the government's option was this one. And it's this no comments, it's terrible. It's the outside of Caracas, destroying everything to provide housing for the poor. Well, some of the examples I, I've been looking for brought me to what's considered um, the um, patrimony of the humanity. I'm translating from Spanish. That's Manarola, Italy, located by the seaside. And then we have Petare, Venezuela. I, I don't think we'll get there in, in a few years, but at least we could transform the settlement in an urban icon. This is the work that we've been doing with Barrios. It's just uh, one of the slides. This is a foothill development of very poor, um, and illegal development. We tried to find out where the very, very small uh, left out spaces that we can work with to make circulations and pedestrian walkways. And the ones that were a little bit wider, we inserted uh, small developments of urban facilities that they lack absolutely. They don't have any open space when they mention here that you have 10 minutes from a park in all around cities in the US, there's no way of getting to an open space here. So if this is the kind of problem where you provide a small space and you really gained a lot. <coughs> the other way, restorative approach, is to reconstruct what we call the urban tissue trying to insert very, very small facilities that 
provide services like schools or health services. We have a, a policy that's called nose cut. In Spanish, it's desnarizar. Some of the buildings, you can cut a little bit of the facade. Uh, residents accept, because even though you lose a little bit of your facade, then you get a new one and you get improvements in your house. When I said public space, that's our main purpose to trying to change, it includes underneath. So some very clever engineers were designing this sewer system and drainage system, a combination of all of them, on the only space available that are those pedestrian walkways. Then we had to find out where can we change, actually. We have the problem. We know that we can change through, through restoration, different kinds of restoration. Then, what can we really change when your design is limited by social variables for us? Then, two main aspects are the ones that are, that are restricting change. One is residents' connection to the site. If they have been living there for a long time, they don't want to move. Absolutely no. And the other one is social domains. Groups of residents, small groups, that live nearby, one, they know each other and they support each other. When they talked about surviving this morning, surviving here is related to belonging to a social domain. You are sure and safe if you belong to a small group that protects you and could take care of your kids, give you some small amounts of food in case you have a, a need for them and you, you can restore them afterwards. So those are the two basic social constraints for developing, for identifying what can we change. So we, we measured residents' connection with the environment through the time of residence. We could say, you have been there 20 years, and everything according to the age of the settlement. And social domains, we had to identify through surveys um, who have continuous relations with whom, whoever have. And then you can define spatially, locate what the social domain is. Combining those, we have a model three that we call upgrading areas that are really the areas where we can work for the beginning. They, they provide a framework for change. And for those areas, we can apply the concepts of restoration and reconciliation. We developed this model. But the model one is the residence connection with the environment. After we did it, we realized that we should have made more intervals because we had more than 25, tw 10 to 14, 15 to 25, because they began settling at the north end and they had been settling towards the south. The last ones here have less than five years, so they are really not, they don't have those strong connections to the site and they are located in the worst area. Uh, I mean, it's uh, irregular topography and not well drained. The other one is the social domains. They have different names, La Flore, El Desvío, and from the name you can tell who belongs to where. Then we have which areas are the upgrading areas. Really, we, st we still have to make a, another run of this one with the smaller intervals, but here is where ArcGIS give the opportunity for doing it in a proper way with a social approach. This one is the last one, and I always have it there because it's the best example of integration with geography, <laughs> Casares Andalusia. And that can tell us that all the vernacular knowledge 
that has been accumulated through years in many, many settlements sometimes can be overflowed by technology and then you miss the proper thing and really what you have to do. <laughs>